and which has impacted billions of lives and is still impacting and is going to impact uh, in a very vast way. So therefore, uh, I request you uh, not to uh, take this as a very classical form of a lecture and uh, just uh, try to enjoy the different uh, facts and uh, tips as we move along. And uh, we will take the questions at the end of the lecture. And so let us move into the this particular technical session. And since we are talking about history, uh, so today is the 5th of July, uh, 2021. And uh, this also coincides with one of the most important developments uh, in the history of semiconductor devices. So first, first of all, let us see uh, what that important development is. So in uh, 1951, which is around 60 years back uh, from this particular date, on this uh, same day, so the Bell Laboratories made a formal announcement of the junction transistor. Uh, so the BJTs, uh, which we very popularly know uh, as of now today, uh, this was the formal announcement of the invention of the BJT was made by the Bell Laboratories uh, on July 5, 1951. Although the developments have been formed uh, prior to that. And uh, prior to the junction transistor, uh, there was the point contact transistor uh, developed by Bourdin and Britain. And uh, at that time, Shockley was not there in the group. So Shockley joined later and um, uh, while inventing the junction transistor. And here are some very interesting uh, snapshots which I would like to present. So what you see on the screen uh, is an invitation uh, for a meeting uh, by the different members of uh, the scientific community at that time for naming this particular device, which we now know as uh, the junction transistor. So if you can see the abstract of this uh, particular meeting, you can see that recommendations are made for an equivalent circuit representation and uh, terminology relating to semiconductor triodes. So this invites the different people uh, to actually vote for the actual name of the device which they had just invented. And you can see from the list that the list con consists of Shockley, Burden, and Britain uh, on number 13, uh, 15, and 16, apart from the other uh, scientists and technologists of that particular time. And uh, between these pages, uh, there were uh, around five to six pages of this particular document. So they had defined different uh, names uh, for this uh, particular transistor. And this is the ballot paper. Uh, who, from which the voting was taken for the different uh, devices. So you can see there are uh, six names uh, which appear in the ballot uh, paper and uh, the transistor appears at the bottom of the list. So ultimately uh, the transistor was voted with maximum uh, votes and therefore we have this today and it has become a part of uh, our lives. So therefore uh, this uh, date, the 5th of July uh, 2021, uh, it celebrates the 60 years of the naming of the transistor, which we have so fondly uh, covered in our books, in our textbooks, in our research papers. And uh, therefore, uh, this is an important date and it is a very good way to start uh, this FDP, I guess. So the key contents of this lecture uh, will be the evolution of semiconductor devices. And this will mainly comprise of the journey towards silicon, how silicon has uh, become one of the most prominent materials and the stories prior to the development of silicon and also the different uh, devices which have uh, become very popular uh, the MOSFETs, FinFETs, TFETs and MEMRISTERS and uh, basically uh, I know that most of you uh, will be doing researches on these devices or are currently doing uh, the different researches so most of the facts may be uh, or the different fundamentals may be known to you uh, but uh, the journey we will try to cover, uh, we will converge from the material perspective towards the device uh, perspective. And finally, we will be taking up a few concepts uh, like the quasi Fermi levels in devices uh, and a very basic overview of the PN junction because uh, the PN junction is the most fundamental uh, element of any modern day FETs, uh, which you see. You will find this junction in almost all the advanced field effect transistors. And uh, this also uh, forms the basis 
of the different concepts and it is very easier to explain the different physics based phenomenon with the help of the pn junction so therefore we will be taking a very basic overview uh, just the band diagram uh, perspective and uh, a very informal way of looking at the uh, derivation using the one dimensional poisson equation and uh, after that we'll be going into the short channel mosfets uh, we will try to look into the reason uh, into the very qualitative reason how why short channel uh, mosfets are degrading the performance and uh, this will also lead uh, to the to the foundation of the upcoming lectures on tunnel fets and fin fets in this ftp and uh, finally one of the most uh, emerging uh, concepts uh, which we find is the quantum capacitance uh, and uh, although the quantum models are a very vast uh, area of the devices but we will just uh, try to have a flavor of this quantum capacitance using the example of uh, silicon nanowire fets uh, where uh, the this uh, quantum capacitance effects uh, become very dominant so uh, let us move into the first part, uh, the evolution. And first of all, we are very familiar with the word uh, semiconductor. So we know that a semiconductor has properties uh, which lie between the properties of uh, metals and uh, insulators. But when, where do we find the origin of this particular uh, concept of the semiconductor? So this is a screenshot of a paper by uh, Alessandro Volta in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society in 1782, uh, which is believed uh, to be one of the very first works uh, which closely resemble uh, the idea of a semiconductor. So in this particular paper, he commented uh, something like this. So this was basically written in uh, Italian or front, French, uh, but there also appeared an English trans translation of a portion of the paper. Uh, from which I have taken this. So it says the surface of those bodies uh, does not contract any electricity or if any electricity adheres to them, it vanishes soon on account of their semiconducting nature, for which reason they cannot answer the office of an electrophorus and therefore are more fit to be used as condensers of electricity. So this is the first account where uh, the idea of semiconductors appear. This is not the first case uh, at that time, uh, the word semiconductor was not uh, formed or was not popularly used, uh, but this is believed to be one of the first works which closely resembles uh, the idea of the semiconducting uh, nature of materials. And after that, uh, all of us have heard of Michael Faraday and uh, his different experiments. So in one of his experiments, he found uh, that the electrical conductivity of silver sulfide increased with uh, increasing temperature. So prior to Michael Faraday, uh, there was Sir Humphrey Davy uh, who had reported the different uh, properties in metals. And uh, Michael Faraday was actually an assistant and a student of uh, Sir Humphrey Davy. So he conducted these experiments on the uh, different other sulfides. And he found that they exhibited properties which are different from the metallic bodies, which were already represent, uh, reported by uh, Humphrey Davy. So from this, uh, ultimately today, we know that uh, the silver sulfide is a direct band gap semiconductor with a band gap of around uh, one electron volt. And from this particular concept, uh, from this particular report, uh, with the relationship of the conductivity with a temperature, we find that raising the temperature in many sem semiconductors increases uh, their carrier density. And this was obviously a very contrasting character with uh, Sir Davies metals. So therefore, this work of Michael Faraday is believed uh, to be the first work which leads the foundation of the semiconductor devices or the word semiconductor. So Volta's work closely resembled the idea and Faraday's work was the closest, uh, uh, the closest relationship with uh, what we today know as uh, the semiconductors. And after that, uh, interestingly, uh, there was another physicist, uh, Carl Ferdinand Braun, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in uh, 1909. And he uh, presented a paper on current conduction through metallic sulfides. And after that, uh, he reported that for normal Ohm's law obeying materials, the current voltage characteristics is both linear and symmetric. 
and he reported the nonlinear asymmetric current voltage characteristics for some uh, metallic sulfides. Uh, for example, lead sulfide, uh, which is which was used in cat's whisker, uh, which we will see uh, what is this cat's whisker, uh, was one of the most important materials of that particular time. So as we move from Volta uh, to Braun, we find uh, that the development in the properties in understanding the properties of the semiconductors increased. Volta, first of all, gave an idea of the semiconductor. Then Faraday, he tried to bring closest resemblance by looking into the properties with uh, temperature. And finally, Braun, he gave the nonlinear uh, IV characteristics uh, for some metallic sulfides. So this was very important developments considering the period in which they were. So we are, we are talking about uh, the 19th century. So it was very important that these developments were coming up at those per point of time. So this is a diagram of the cat's whisker. Uh, so it is very interesting why it is called cat's whisker. So uh, a whisker is uh, the mustache of a cat, uh, the hair which is present uh, aside his nose or his ears. So if you see, uh, if you closely see this particular uh, cat's whisker, you will find there's a very thin uh, metallic wire, which uh, which is actually represented as the whisker of a cat. So this particular device is nothing uh, but a junction. Uh, there's a metallic wire uh, in connection with uh, the uh, lead sulfide. So actually there is there are two different materials and the point at which the joint is actually behaving as a junction. So therefore, prior to the PN junctions, uh, these were used as rectifiers uh, in the devices. And this was used uh, as a detector in uh, antenna for rectification and for uh, retrieving uh, the sound and pushing it to the phones. And this was a basic circuit. And you can see the cat's whisker is the detector which is used here. And if you see, look into the equivalent circuit, it is very, it will be very familiar to you. So it is basically a rectifying uh, diode kind of thing. Remember, we have uh, seen, we, we know now that the cat's whisker is nothing but a junction. So if there is a junction, there are two different dissimilar materials. So this can also, this is actually a very primitive representation of the diode. So therefore, uh, this was used uh, in those times uh, to receive the signals from the antenna and then uh, demodulate them and pass it to the headphones, which is shown in this. So it is very interesting uh, that this lead sulfide, uh, which is which came out as a result of the work of Braun, uh, was finally used in uh, rectifying you know, for rectifying purposes. And later on, these were uh, replaced by uh, silicon, as we will see. And uh, after that, uh, we have another phenomenon which occurred in between these events. In 1839, Alexander Edmund Becquerel, he uh, designed an electrode uh, electrolyte junction. So there were basically two electrodes uh, which were connected by the electrolyte, which was very uh, popular arrangement at that, that particular point of time. Uh, but he did not mention uh, whether the electrolyte had the properties of a semiconductor, which was later uh, discovered by uh, Willow V. Smith in 1873. So he was an engineer who worked on underwater uh, telegraph cable system. And he used selenium, uh, which because he needed a very high resistance material. And interestingly, while testing the different cables uh, underneath uh, the, the subway system, he found that the resistance of the selenium bars, which we used, uh, actually varied with light. So in the beginning, uh, he was finding it very difficult because uh, he purchased these particular bars of selenium and he thought that they would provide him the exactly the high resistance which he required. But while placing them, uh, some of the bars came under the influence of the light as a result of which he did not get the resistance which he required. So during this uh, entire experimentation by Smith, uh, the problems he, which he, were facing, he was facing, so he had an assistant by the name of Joseph May uh, who found that actually uh, the resistance of these selenium bars, they varied with light. And he published this, uh, Smith published this entire um, experimentation uh, in Nature. And uh, here he has written in very brief how the bars were exactly giving him 1400 mega ohms of resistance. But when it came under the influence of light, 
the resistance drop. And therefore, in order to further uh, bring a testimony to the observations which he had, so he enclosed these bars in, with a sliding cover on top so that he could slide the cover up and down. Uh, he could cover it and also he could uncover the bars and check the influence of light on that. So this was a conceptual diagram of the system by uh, W. Smith. The black portion is the selenium bar and he enclosed it inside a glass tube uh, for testing uh, the different uh, telegraph cable systems. And on both hands, uh, he had these platinum wires. So if you see, uh, over time, uh, this photoconductivity actually was an uh, accidental discovery, which further was uh, improvised by Smith because he could exactly find at that moment the problem which he was facing and he tried to go for the solution. Had he not gone for the solution of that particular uh, selenium bar, uh, then we would not have uh, this amazing uh, phenomenon of photoconductivity or uh, it could have been delayed uh, in time. So from this photoconductivity, we also have uh, the, the most important uh, process which we use today, the Xerox copier machines, uh, the different uh, Xerox machines which we use. Uh, exactly, they are because of this photoconductivity discovery. So Chester Floyd Carlson uh, was the first person who brought this uh, Xerox uh, idea, xerography, uh, into the picture. And previously, the wet process was used for photocopying, just like uh, for uh, the photograph films, which were used. But Carlson, for the first time, he introduced the concept of the toner, uh, which is uh, even popularly used today. So based on that, he tried uh, different uh, materials. The pails and plates were tried, coated drums were tried, and uh, the silver coating failed to have that particular impression which he required. And finally, he succeeded with uh, the zinc plate with selenium coating. So therefore, uh, the point of uh, bringing this photoconductivity into the picture uh, in between uh, the process for the sulfides is that as the industry or as the scientific community moved towards silicon, so there were many important developments uh, which were there in between, which contributed actually to the invention of uh, this uh, use of the silicon material. Uh, otherwise, if you think, uh, so this also points to a perspective that any development that we make today, any research work that we uh, do today may impact the society with a very larger impact uh, after, say, uh, decades of research. So therefore, this also provides the motivation for, this should provide a motivation for the present the researchers, the different faculty members who are working, and uh, the different problems that you see must be tried uh, to have the best possible solution. And this was the reason which uh, Carlson provided, uh, was that selenium had its very unique crystal lattice, and it, re it could retain that electrostatic charge indef indefinitely, which was very much required for transferring that optically induced image uh, from one device uh, to the paper, uh, due to which we have this uh, modern day Xerox uh, machines. And finally, we uh, are here for silicon, the industry's favorite element. Uh, although we are looking for different alternatives, but still uh, most of the fabrication processes are built uh, on the silicon fabrication flow. And uh, the discovery of the silicon uh, was in 1824 and is attributed to a Swedish chemist, uh, John Jacob Berzelius. And uh, he actually invented, he actually formed the amorphous silicon, but later on the crystalline silicon was uh, developed by a German chemist named Frederick Oller. And after that, the first use of silicon was not actually in uh, the actual devices which we see today. So the term, there was a new material which was formed, which was known as the silicon steel. Uh, so it, in this particular process, silicon was added to steel to have less eddy current loss in the transformer. So it was used uh, in electrical transformers and in those days. So we have a short uh, video here from the BBC, uh, which represents uh, the different important uh, developments in silicon and how this particular material is so important in this day. So prior to this, uh, the silicon, you know, can be formed from this quartz uh, or the silica. And quartz came to be known as the white gold 
uh, once it entered into the semiconductor industry fabrication flow. And this is a very short video which shows uh, the importance of this silicon. We're probably the most global manufacturing industry in the world. The silicon, which is the essence of these chips, probably goes around the world two or three times. You can take sand and turn it into semiconductors that allows us to talk with family around the world by these little computers in our pockets. I don't know. We need the energy to do its job on the rock, crack it in reasonable sized pieces, and we'll run it through the crusher, get that down to an inch and a half, and then the plant will take it. It will go through another milling so that other contaminants can be liberated and then it'll be sent to a refinery. This is the material that comes out after grinding and flow and separation. All of these deposits in spruce pine have that natural purity that make them great for the semiconductor industry. The uh, reserves here in the spruce pine area are very strong. We have decades of material. Probably the industry will change before we run out of it. Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes sir. sir. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so uh, the reason for showing this video is because this area that you see is true spine, as it says. So earlier, this uh, particular area was excavated for different gemstones and mica. But once uh, the silicon industry was formed, uh, this particular area became very well known for the quartz. Uh, and it turned into white gold for this uh, manufacturers and suppliers. And uh, as per their estimate, uh, they provide around uh, 10,000 million US dollars uh, per metric ton of this particular quartz uh, as they supply to the industry. So this is where we get uh, our devices for, from. Uh, so in a way, we are actually dependent on nature to get this particular materials which get processed and then appear on our mobile phones or laptops and other electronic devices. So proceeding with uh, the lecture. So first of all, we will uh, go with uh, Russell Ohl and the PN Junction. So the story of the PN Junction is uh, pretty interesting. Uh, we had this particular electrochemist at Bell Telephone Labs. Uh, he started investigating the use of silicon rectifiers as radar detectors. Although he was asked not to do so, uh, because uh, people used uh, tried to like go on with the existing materials, but Russell Ohl uh, is one of the very uh, unsung heroes of the semiconductor industry. Uh, he was very adamant uh, because he was working on this uh, silicon material for a long time, and he wanted to uh, have an advent of some discovery in this particular field. And uh, in 23 February, on 23 February 1940, he tested a small silicon slab. Uh, that yielded very strange uh, results. Uh, actually, he was very tired of the and frustrated about the different results. Uh, he could not form that uh, rectifying action uh, in uh, this particular silicon slab. So he just left it in his lab and uh, went back home. The next morning when he came back, uh, he found that on getting exposed to a light uh, from, his, uh, from his lamp, uh, there, the current jumped in that particular device. And this created very uh, curiosity in his mind. And he wanted to know the different um, reasons behind it. So he called uh, the in charge of that particular uh, project. And after all, they, after, after all the investigations they did, they found that the slab had a very small crack in between, which created, uh, which had the imp impression of uh, just like a junction. So therefore, uh, there were different uh, impurities on both sides of the junction because of that small uh, defect in that particular slab. 
and uh, when light was incident on it, uh, the different electron hole pairs were generated, and so the current jumped. So this led to the first uh, discovery of uh, the photovoltaic effect, uh, which powers today's uh, solar cells. So there were other for scientists who actually proposed uh, the photovoltaic effect, but Russell Ohl's work, uh, for, for it, it leads to the foundation of today's uh, solar cells. And also it went on to give the PN junction because uh, he could find that dissimilar uh, amount of doping or dissimilar impurities on both sides of that particular crack uh, could give rise uh, to a rectifying action. So this is very interesting. Again, uh, this was an accident. Uh, and uh, by accident, he came to know about uh, the different properties. And uh, finally, we come to towards uh, closer to the modern day MOSFETs. And, uh, in 1928, uh, this person, Julius E. Lillianfeld, he filed a patent uh, titled uh, this device for controlling electric current. And it was not known actually at the point of time when uh, Burden and Brettain, they formed this point contact transistor and the junction transistor. And a total of 65 claims in the patents uh, by this uh, legendary inventors were rejected because of Lillianfeld's patent. So one of the claims of this patent was field effect. And Shockley, Burden, and Brittain, they also went for the claim of field effect, but it was rejected because Lillianfeld had already uh, filed for the field effect in 1933. So this is a screenshot from his uh, patent application uh, by Lillianfeld. And uh, therefore, uh, at this point of time, what I would like to mention here or highlight here is that the inventions which are done along the different uh, timelines in history. So most of them may remain uh, uncovered or undiscovered, but as you move with time, there will be uh, uh, the requirement of such actions or such phenomena in devices. So at that time, this get uh, covered, this get uncovered, and as a result of which we have very amazing technologies in today's world. So this was not the case for only for field effect. There are many devices uh, where uh, this particular, uh, this type of particular hiding of that phenomenon in the books of history were there, and later on uh, these were revealed. So MOSFETs, uh, as we know, the metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistors. Uh, so there is a very controversial uh, history behind the invention of uh, MOSFETs. So therefore. Uh, when we look into the question of who invented MOSFETs, uh, so at that time we have these uh, particular brief summary. In 1956, uh, the two persons, Atala and Kang, at Bell Laboratories, while working on surface passivation problems, they built the insulated gate uh, field effect transistor. So uh, the surface passivation problems were due to the surface states uh, which could occur or appear on the surface of the semiconductor, and this largely affected. Uh, the transport mechanism in the, uh, in the semiconductors. And uh, during that time, uh, they built this insulated gate field effect transistor, but their work uh, never got a wide recognition. And they remain in the official papers of uh, Bell Labs. And of, in 1962, uh, Hyman and Hofstein, they built uh, another insulated gate field effect transistor, and it is considered to be in line with the invention of MOSFETs. So if you go into the different books or the papers which speak about Attila and Kang's uh, invention, so there you will find how different conspiracies and industrial competition uh, uh, tried to uh, bury their research in, uh, the, uh, in, in that particular time so that they could not receive uh, that wide recognition during that time. And you can go and look into this reference which, is, uh, which appears at the bottom of this slide and it is a very interesting uh, article uh, where you will find lots of uh, interesting facts about uh, the history of the metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistors. And after that, uh, once again, uh, we are moving towards the advanced devices as uh, part the uh, uh, objective of this FDP and this uh, short term program. And uh, in 1952, uh, we are talking about tunnel FETs here. So we will look into what this particular device is is it works on the principle of uh, the band-to-band -band tunneling and uh, we will look in the upcoming slide how this device operates so uh, in this uh, particular year in 1952 uh, Stuetzer proposed uh, this particular device which he called the junction fill disters 
and uh, he used a pn junction to demonstrate the effect of position of gate uh, over the junction and then look into the different tunneling uh, properties so if you can recall a pn junction uh, which op which has the uh, ability to operate in both forward and reverse bias so if you operate it in the reverse bias and you can modulate uh, the band gap uh, using a third electrode at the top of the junction then you can have a very interesting transistor action so that was the concept behind uh, the device which was proposed uh, by stwedger in uh, 1952 and it was very uh, primitive uh, because he used in 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 place of this insulator or the dielectric he used this uh, liquid oil or this electrolyte uh, but the results were very encouraging and this was the first time when uh, the third the third control electrode over a pn junction uh, was shown and the effects were shown were demonstrated experimentally by uh, stwedger and this was uh, this is just an image of that particular fabricated device uh, proposed by stwedger now coming to uh, the tfets uh, basically if we are talking about uh, an n channel mosfet so you have uh, three regions the n plus source uh, the p type body and then finally you have the n plus drain and over that over the channel over the length between the source and the drain uh, you have your gate dielectric and the gate metal now in case of tfets if you replace uh, uh, this n plus in the source uh, by a heavily doped p plus layer and the substrate if you replace it by an intrinsic layer so basically you have a pi n uh, diode kind of structure and over that you place the gate so you see uh, a barrier which is formed uh, on application of the gate voltage so this is an animation uh, which shows uh, the formation of that uh, barrier in this uh, tunneling field effect transistors so if, when you are increasing the gate voltage so at that time the barriers will get the energy bands will get suppressed and at when this reach around 1.5 volt if you are looking into this animation you will find that there is an overlap of the bands uh, in the valence band of the source and the conduction band in the channel and in that particular region you have uh, the tunneling barrier so this uh, entire concept is very interesting uh, because the isaki tunnel diodes were proposed by isaki and he went on to win the nobel prize but interestingly uh, stwedger had proposed this junction filters uh, way before uh, isaki Uh, won the nobel prize or proposed uh, the idea of this tunnel diodes so therefore at that time when uh, stwedger was proposing this device and he published this article uh, he named it field distors and did not mention uh, about the tunneling um, effects or the tunnel he did not name it as uh, the tunnel field effect transistor so this is very uh, brief idea about the operation and its uh, difference with mosfets So in MOSFETs, you basically have this operation by thermionic emission, uh, where the carriers from the source uh, have the ability to cross the barrier and move over to the drain side. But in TFETs, uh, you have a tunneling approach. So the particle, the electron or the hole which we are talking about, has the ability to penetrate the barrier and move on to the other side. So this is also a case uh, where you have the quantum mechanical effects. this is also a case of a device uh, where you can use uh, explicitly the schrodinger's wave equation and find out uh, the drain current although there are other ways of arriving at the drain current using the uh, poisson based uh, equations so therefore tfets are very interesting devices uh, because uh, you can modulate this barrier and over time uh, there have been lots of analytical models which have been proposed on tfets and apart from that there are many works which are left uh, in the area of tfet just because uh, you have this barrier modulation format uh, in this particular devices and after that let us move to one of the most uh, popularly used uh, devices uh, on present date uh, after the mosfets uh, which is the finfets and uh, cheming hu uh, who won the 2020 ieee medal of honor award uh he is known as the father of finfets and interestingly uh he sketched the designs of this finfets when he was traveling uh on a plane ride to japan so this there was a call for this project proposal when they found that 
the Moore's law was finally coming to an end. So DARPA, uh, which is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency of the USA, they gave out a call for eminent scientists uh, to propose an alternative device which could uh, reduce the power consumption of low power devices. And uh, during that time, uh, Chemi Ho took up the task of uh, designing uh, the first designs of FinFETs. And it was very difficult at, beginning, at the beginning because almost everything has been tried on MOSFETs. Uh, but finally, uh, the architecture which he formed, the fin-shaped uh, structure of these FinFETs, which basically work on uh, the MOSFET principles itself. Therefore, that reduced uh, lots of efforts or investments uh, and gave a device which, which could immediately be commercialized and uh, it came into the market. So most of the mobile phones uh, that uh, we use today have this FinFET technology. And uh, the first one, I think, rolled out with the 14 nanometer technology node. And finally, uh, now we are moving into the seven nanometers and even uh, ultra low scaling node. So uh, this was uh, the invention of the FinFET and it was very rapid. Uh, another reason for why it was rapid, if you could perceive, is because it is based on the fundamentals of MOSFETs. Uh, so therefore, it was, um, uh, it was very uh, convenient uh, to bring the analogy with the MOSFETs and then uh, bring up a fin-shaped structure over uh, the substrate. And uh, apart from this, actually, uh, the journey for these advanced FETs, there are many advanced FETs which have come up. Uh, we have the fellow ferroelectric field effect transistors, the spin uh, field effect transistors, and different negative capacitance based field effect transistors. So we are not taking the, those up in this particular lecture. But again, we are taking up uh, another device, which is the memristor, which is also very popular. And uh, the reason for its popularity is, is the convenience in its fabrication and the different easier models, which could predict uh, its particular performance. And this is one point uh, where I would again uh, bring back uh, the earlier reference of how things get hidden in the history books. So in 1971, uh, Leon Chua, uh, who is the uh, postulator of the concept of memristive action. So he proposed uh, that apart from resistance, capacitance, and inductance, uh, there must be another fourth element uh, because the equations were not getting completed. Uh, the relationships between the different uh, elements. So therefore, he gave out a theoretical description of memristors. It is very interesting. Uh, he just gave out the equations and the concepts of this uh, particular memristors in 1971. And in 1976, he extended this memristive concept to entire devices and systems. He gave out formulas and models for different devices and systems and also compared uh, the same uh, with the existing uh, systems which he had uh, using the passive components. And, but the most interesting part is in 2008, uh, the memristor was first realized in, uh, it was first fabricated uh, by Hewlett Packard, which is popularly known as the HP Labs. And they reported the first fabrication of the inorganic memristor uh, using tin dioxide as the material. And it is very interesting that even before 1972, uh, when uh, this uh, memristor was first being postulated by Chua, and even after 1972, there were many experiments or instances where scientists have done experiments on different materials on different systems, and which actually uh, depicted the memristive action, but they were not aware of it, or uh, most probably they were reporting uh, for some other applications. So therefore, uh, the entire web network of memristors, uh, it dates back to uh, very uh, old, older times than 1971. But the actual concept was uh, given in 1971 by Chua. And finally, uh, in 2008, after around uh, 37 years, uh, it was first fabricated. So we will just have a look at what this, what this memristor is. So it is basically the missing link between charge and flux. So we have these uh, four parameters or four variables that we see, the voltage, current, flux, and charge, right? And we know that uh, a relationship between the voltage and current, it gives uh, the property of a resistor. And similarly, for capacitance, we can relate uh, the charge and the voltage. And for inductance, we can relate the flux 
and the current. So therefore, the argument of Chua was that there is a missing relation between the charge and the flux. So therefore, there should be another element uh, which could fill this particular gap. And therefore, he proposed uh, this relationship as the memory stents. And uh, the symbol is as it is shown in this particular slide. So in this way, the different links, uh, the missing links were tried to be searched. And then he postulated the formulation of this memory stir. And this is a very simple model of the HP lab memory stir, which they fabricated. So they had this doped uh, TiO2 and undoped TiO2. And uh, both uh, sides were just connected with the platinum electrodes. And if you see on the right hand side of the slide, so you will find that it exhibited two resistance uh, states. So when you apply the voltage, uh, the entire device or the entire active region could become undoped or also it could be covered with the entire doped TiO2 on application of that particular voltage. So if you sweep the voltage in the forward direction and again bring it back, so you'll find two resistance st states at the same voltage. Therefore, it led uh, to the hysteresis kind of characteristics where you had two states uh, located uh, on the same voltage point. And this was a very linear drift diffusion model of the uh, memory stir. And this was dependent, as you can see, if you can relate, uh, the XT was defined as the variable which relates the uh, width of the doped TiO2 and D was the entire length. So just by a linear relationship, they tried to find out uh, the memory stress property. Obviously, this is a very crude model. And later on, uh, many window functions were uh, discovered. This model has many disadvantages, uh, which we will not discuss here. Uh, but for just for the sake of information, the primary disadvantage is that this model could not capture uh, the boundaries of that particular movement of this doped and undoped TiO2. So it is just a movement of the phase uh, within this particular active region uh, between doped and undoped TiO2. So uh, if you are applying the voltage, at some point of time, the entire bar will become doped uh, TiO2. And on the reverse uh, voltage application, you will find that the entire uh, bar becomes undoped uh, TiO2. And in between them, you have the IV characteristics. So this is just uh, what I was talking about, the hysteresis uh, loop. And it has to be a pinched hysteresis. So pinched hysteresis means that it has to have crossover uh, somewhere. So th there were even unpinched hysteresis which were reported. Uh, and uh, in one of the very uh, latest articles by Chua, where he has given an overview on the memory stiff action, it is a very beautiful paper, uh, review paper. And in that particular paper, he talked about the different materials and the different systems and he reviewed his whole concept of memory stirs. And he also gave uh, out the properties by which you can identify a memory stir. And one of them is this pinched hysteresis loop. And this pinched part has to be at the origin uh, as per Chua. But later on, it was found that it can have slight shifts from the origin because most of the times uh, you can have this calibration effects of the measuring equipment. So therefore, probably there was this shifts of the origin point, but it lies in and around the origin of the IV characteristics. So this is a very interesting property and a very interesting device. And memory stirs have now formed a part of the neural networks because uh, it has this memory property. Uh, this is memory stir is memory plus registers. So therefore, you have two states and it can remember uh, the value in which it was uh, when you switch on and off the device. So therefore, memory stirs are very popularly used because of this convenience in its fabrication. It is a two terminal device, so you don't have to invest much. And also, uh, these are currently being explored for sensing applications. So now we move to one of the most uh, important and a very generalized law of the semiconductor industry. And this is relevant or this is known by almost all of you the Moore's law. And uh, when Moore first of all formulated this law, it was not a law actually. It was just an observation which he reported to his uh, employees uh, that by observing only three data points uh, from different manufacturing uh, agencies. And that became a law because 
uh, it was very interesting that people tried uh, to satisfy the economics of the market and therefore they had to cram more components on the same chip area to increase the functionality because that was the demand so unless you meet the demands of the uh, industry so it was very difficult to progress and therefore the moore's law became uh, a thumb rule in the semiconductor industry and we are very very familiar with this particular law but one of the most interesting uh, things which i would like to mention here is a statement from the economist uh, on April 19, 2015. And here it says, I am not going to read the whole part, uh, that and a few years ago, just the third sentence, when transistors 28 nanometer wide were the state of the art, chip makers found their design and manufacturing costs beginning to rise sharply. So as they tried to shrink the devices, so earlier on the same chip area, they were cramming this more components to have more functionalities. So that actually reduced their costs. But once it went below the 28 nanometer uh, technology node, so then it now started to have uh, more expenses on the different uh, organizations. Uh, but again, as it says in the last sentence, transistors can be shrunk further, but they are now getting more expensive. So that is the ultimate uh, point where Moore's law was finally looked up, uh, looked upon by the more than Moore and uh, the beyond CMOS uh, logic laws or the different predictions by the I ITRS, which is now popularly known as the IRDS. Uh, but also, I need to point out one thing. Uh, this statement was uh, from 2015, after the lots have changed. And uh, uh, currently, uh, as before, uh, people used to focus uh, the, on the cramming more components into the chip and rather now uh, they are focusing on the application oriented uh, fabrication of the devices so that functionality is not uh, the ultimate priority uh, but uh, sorry the cramming more components is not the ultimate priority but the functionality of that particular uh, device is so therefore uh, the Moore's law it was a very and also is one of the most popular and very widely followed uh, thumb rules of the semiconductor industry. And based on this law, uh, the advanced devices, which we know today, uh, they have evolved uh, because of the demands set forward by this particular law. And this is a roadmap uh, by the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors, uh, which, has which is now known as uh, International Roadmap for Devices and Systems. So uh, on the left hand side, the figure which I show, you will find the different uh, emerging devices uh, which are mentioned. And these are the areas actually where you need to work or where you need to uh, concentrate your uh, research problems because this is going to be the next big thing uh, in uh, the semiconductor industry. And on the right hand side, uh, you see a roadmap which was predicted till 2028 uh, by ITRS 2013. So at that time, it was not IRDS. So this uh, particular uh, prediction, if you see, it speaks about the different devices, uh, the nanowire MOSFETs, uh, the 3.5, and the tunnel FETs. And it has split up the different colors uh, into the research, which is still required, the development, which is underway after the research, uh, the qualification for pre-production, and the continuous improvement, which is required. So based on these predictions, uh, which are collected uh, from the different works which are going on in the world. So based on this, you can uh, target your problem statements and you can work on the different devices. So now we will move into the very simpler concepts uh, of uh, this uh, semiconductor devices, as we have talked in the outline, uh, in the slide of outline. And we will start with uh, the energy potential and electric field, which is very familiar to you. Uh, but still, uh, let us look into the different uh, perspectives of these uh, particular terms. So you have this bar of n-type silicon, uh, which is this energy band diagram. So you have uh, the edge of the conduction band, the edge of the valence band, uh, the Fermi level, and the intrinsic Fermi level, right? So basically, one more thing which I would like to point out is that most of us have these confusions, uh, mostly among the students, uh, that this EC level which we see uh, is actually the conduction band. 
so basically it is not the band it is the level or the edge of the conduction band so the idea of uh, the band theory of solids uh, is to have a very simpler perspective into the device uh, physics otherwise if you look into the actual band theory so there are many quantum mechanical concepts starting from the block theory and the chronic penny model and finally you will see the different states which appear so basically when we are talking about ec and ev we are talking about the edges uh, of the conduction band and the valence band now if we uh, apply a potential on one side and uh, with respect to the other so the bands will bend in this particular format right so you need to understand that at regions of high potential uh, you will be having a suppressed band and the, at the region of low potential you will be having uh, a very elevated band this is because of the relationship between uh, the potential and uh, the energy bands and the electric field it moves from the high potential region to the low potential region right now why does why does this happen let us look into the equation or the expression of the electric field so if you see here uh, this this electric field it is expressed as a negative of the differential of the potential and i can substitute this potential uh, by the energy so i can take up any energy level here i am picking up the intrinsic energy level and finally i find that my electric field is directly proportional to the slope of uh, this particular energy uh, level here so here we have chosen uh, the intrinsic fermi level uh, we can choose any one here uh, because all of them will have to maintain the electrostatics uh, between the bands so therefore by looking at the nature of the slope actually we can tell the direction of the electric field so without having to look into the regions of potentials and without having to calculate we can directly say that the electric field points in the direction of the positive slope of uh, the bands so it can be either of the bands but here we have selected the intrinsic fermi level because it comes out as a very good reference uh, for uh, the semiconductors next we move uh, to the concept of uh, the quasi fermi levels so this is one of the most important concepts uh, in devices uh, mostly uh, you have already encountered this in, in your pn junction theory uh, where the difference between the two quasi fermi levels actually give you uh, the built in potential Uh, but what are these quasi fermi levels like why are we defining uh, quasi fermi levels because we are so much comfortable with the normal uh, fermi level of a device or a semiconductor so why why are we going for this uh, quasi fermi levels first of all uh, this quasi uh, which it means is that the term quasi means that it is just like uh, the fermi level so it is just similar to the fermi levels but it is not exactly Uh, the normal fermi level therefore these are known as quasi fermi levels to distinguish uh, between the exact fermi level and the fermi levels which come out as a result of the excess uh, carrier concentration so in order to look at uh, the importance of this quasi fermi levels let us uh, take a very brief example so once again uh, i take up an n type uh, silicon bar and i shine some light on that particular uh, bar as a result of which you will find that it will split into the quasi fermi levels but why is it happening so uh, because earlier we had a single fermi level and now we need uh, two fermi levels to uh, explain uh, the properties of the electrons and the holes so now let us look into a very simpler uh, mathematical deduction of this particular concept so let us first assume that this n type semiconductor is doped with 10 to the power 15 uh, per centimeter cube so therefore the concentration of holes uh, from uh, the very simpler relationship of mass action law we will find that it is very small and it is equal to uh, 2.25 into 10 to the power 5 per centimeter cube now once you excite the semiconductor once you provide this external energy so there will be a creation of electron and hole pairs so therefore we let us assume that there is a very high generation of these pairs and it is equal to 10 to the power 12 per centimeter cube now you try to calculate uh, the net carriers for the holes as well as the electrons 
So you will find that for the holes, you have to add this 10 to the power 12 uh, to the original concentration, uh, which was before shining the light on the n semiconductor. And you find that it has gone from 10 to the power 5 of the order of 10 to the power 5 to 10 to the power 12, right? So this is a very huge increase in the concentration of these holes because earlier it was very small. And after that, you see that the concentration of electrons, uh, these are of the same order, right? So now uh, you will find that this rise, which is there from 10 to the power five by to 10 to the power 12, which is around seven orders of rise uh, in the concentration of holes, this cannot be explicitly explained by a single Fermi level. So there has to be uh, another Fermi level which explains the concentration of these holes because for a very smaller concentration of the holes, the intrinsic Fermi level will coincide with uh, the quasi Fermi level of the holes. But now you have so huge concentration of holes after this excitation that you cannot explain uh, the concentration or it would be very wrong to explain the density of these carriers using only one Fermi level, which is which belongs to the electrons. Therefore, we have to split up uh, the Fermi levels as per the concentration of uh, the electrons and the holes. So the main idea behind this is, so we need not look at how the device is doped and then decide on the Fermi level. We need to see the current state of concentration of carriers in that particular uh, semiconductor bar and then uh, you can decide uh, on the uh, existence of these Fermi levels. Another more, uh, one more correction I would like to make here. So in case of these electrons, I have written this 2.25 into 10 to the power five. So it will be 10 to the power 12 because the original concentration was 10 to the power 15. And now we are adding uh, 10 to the power 12 per centimeter cube of uh, carriers. So which basically remains the same. This is just a typographical error on the slide. So I think uh, the concept is clear uh, why we need quasi Fermi levels and why they are very important. And uh, another point which I would like to mention here uh, for the people or for the participants, uh, for the respected faculty members who are working on uh, the semiconductor devices. So if you are working on the simulation aspects of uh, devices, if you are using certain specific tools, so often the location of this uh, quasi Fermi level, it, it, it can speak a lot of things uh, which cannot be exactly revealed by the normal energy band diagram. Therefore, this location of the quasi Fermi levels is very, very important uh, while analyzing a semiconductor device. So while you are finding out reasons for the different uh, characteristics of your plots from our different advanced devices. So often you will find that uh, the reasons are not sufficient to support your uh, transfer characteristics. So in that case, uh, you can look into the quasi Fermi level locations uh, to find out uh, how it is changing. So often it is it has been found that the quasi Fermi levels often contains information which is uh, actually not revealed uh, by the normal potential plots or the uh, energy band diagrams. So now we move into the PN junction. Uh, this is uh, very fam this must be very familiar to you, uh, but just an overview of uh, looking into the qualitative aspects because uh, most of the participants are uh, students uh, in this particular program. So I would like to go into through a very brief notation uh, through the entire steps. So basically, it is a metallurgical junction that you see between the p-type and n-type semiconductors, and they are doped uh, with dopants and acceptor uh, impurities. And the formation of the depletion width or the space charge region is one of the most important uh, uh, phenomenon in this PN junction, because once you bring together uh, two materials which are dissimilar and have different proportion of impurities on both sides, so the impurities will start flowing from one end to another or the majority carriers which you say, as a result of which they will leave behind uh, the uncovered atoms or the ions uh, behind as a result of which you have this depletion region. So since these uncovered ions, these acceptor ions and the donor ions are immobile, they do not contribute uh, to your uh, 
current conduction process. Therefore, that particular region is said to be depleted of uh, the actual charges uh, which contribute to the current conduction. Therefore, it is known as uh, the depletion region. So this is uh, obviously, you know, most of you have come across this, but uh, still a very quick review on uh, what is the depletion region in, in a PN junction. So before the contact, you will see that if you are taking a P-type and an N-type uh, material, you will find its uh, energy bands, uh, something like this. So you have the local vacuum level at uh, E0. And from there, you try to measure the different uh, work functions and the electron affinity. And this is the representation which you see. And most importantly, which you need to look here uh, is uh, the location of the Fermi levels of uh, the P-type and the N-type regions. And this happens to be your electron affinity, which is the uh, distance between uh, the conduction band and the local uh, vacuum level. And these are your work functions. So this is the state of your uh, bands of the two dissimilar materials before the contact is made. And once the contact is made, you find uh, that it tries to find a slope. It tries to find a uniform level because the carriers are now moving from the region of high concentration towards the uh, region of which is deficit uh, of that particular carriers. And therefore, it tries to maintain a stability by forming uh, a single Fermi level uh, throughout the device. And once again, uh, if you recall one of the previous slides, you just try to match uh, the direction of the electric field uh, with the slope of the bands. So wherever there is a positive slope, the electric field uh, is pointed in that direction. Obviously, you can also look at it uh, from, uh, the move, from the direction of the positive to the negative charge, which is another way of looking at the electric field. But this gives you a different perspective uh, while modeling a particular device because the electric field is given by the positive slope uh, of the bands. Now, looking closely into the picture, we are so familiar with the Poisson equation. We have done these derivations ample amount of times. Uh, but can we uh, draw the electric field profile and the surface potential or the potential profile in a PN junction uh, just by looking at the particular picture? So you have this uh, PN junction, as we have seen. Uh, you have the depletion weights. And from there, if we try to plot the ND minus NA uh, versus X, so you will find something like this. Uh, on the N side, uh, the NA is almost zero, is very negligible. So therefore, you have the ND. Uh, and on the left-hand side, in the P-type material, you have minus of NA. And this translates uh, to small n minus small p. So this small n is nothing uh, but the concentration of electrons. And this is the concentration of holes. So therefore, if you observe in this region, you don't have any electrons or any holes. So therefore, your this concentration profile is 0. So this is what is meant by the depletion uh, width of this particular PN junction. And finally, if you are uh, expressing it uh, in terms of uh, the charge density or the carrier density, you find something like this with the inclusion of the depletion layer approximation, which means that beyond Xn, which is the end of the depletion width on the end side, and beyond minus of Xp, which is uh, the end of the depletion width on the P side, uh, there will be no electric field. So that is the depletion layer approximation, although once again, since it is an approximation, so actually in physical sense, it, this does not re resemble the entire picture, but it helps us to arrive at very comfortable equations, uh, which can very well mimic uh, the characteristics of the PN junction. So once again, uh, now let us look into the question which I had put earlier. Can we draw uh, the electric field profile or the surface potential uh, or the electrostatic potential profile of uh, a PN junction just by looking at uh, the different um, arrangements of this particular picture. So if we are talking about a PN junction, so the first thing which we will get is this particular diagram, which is the charge density. And now uh, you can see the negative and the positive values on both sides of the junction. And you have the one dimensional Poisson equation, which you have seen. So now if we are to formulate 
the electric field. So first of all, what I will do, I will try to find out what is the slope of that particular uh, plot on the left hand side, on the right hand side of the junction. So on the left hand side, it has a negative slope. So it means if it has a negative slope and it is a constant, so therefore my curve on the left hand side, if I start from the left hand side, it will start something like this, right, as shown. And we have already approximated that beyond minus of XP, my electric field will be zero. So therefore we need not worry about this particular region. Once again, finally, we know that on the right hand side, again, I have a positive slope. So therefore, once I reach the junction, so I will start from here. And once I reach the junction, I know that I'll have to move in the reverse direction, right? So this means we have only one option that this is the maximum value which can be assumed by the electric field because we are moving in the opposite direction in the next case because it has a positive slope. Had it been the other way around, then probably we would have moved something like this and then it would have been difficult to find out uh, the electric field. But we know that the maximum electric field, but we know that we'll be moving in the opposite direction. So therefore we have a positive slope. And so we know that we have a maximum electric field here. And also we know that the electric field has to be continuous across the particular PN junction. So therefore, we now know three different things. The first one, across the other ends of the depletion width, we have zero electric field. And we know the nature of the curve on the left-hand side, which is the P type side, and on the N type side. And thirdly, we also know that it will always have a maximum electric field. And we can find out by finding out the slope and the different points, right? And from here, it becomes again easier because now you see if your electric field profile is this, so you have already found out a straight lines and your potential is nothing, uh, but it is negative of the electric field slope, right? So it means if you have to find out uh, the electrostatic potential profile, so it will be quadratic in nature. So therefore you will find uh, a plot, which is something like this. So by looking at the charge density profile of this uh, PN junction, and by looking at the one dimensional Poisson equation, you need not solve it and find out a very comfortable qualitative uh, formulation of the energy band uh, in the first hand approximation. So this is the basic idea uh, because often we see students struggling uh, to uh, solve uh, this particular equations and finding out the different profiles. So this is another way of uh, understanding uh, how you can relate the equations uh, to the plots. So now uh, another important aspect uh, is understanding the transfer characteristics of MOSFETs and advanced FETs. So once you have uh, built a device either on the simulation aspect or on uh, a modeling aspect or from a fabrication point of view. So now you need to compare with the existing devices. Otherwise, your uh, device uh, cannot be benchmarked. So therefore, in that case, you need to know certain parameters which are very important for this uh, low power applications. So the first, of one, first one is the threshold voltage of that particular device. So this is with respect to a MOSFET, but um, the general terminologies ap apply. Uh, to the advanced field effect transistors as well. So the first thing is the on current of a device. So whenever we are talking about the on current, if you are not mentioning uh, the gate voltage at which you are measuring or any voltage parameters, it means uh, you are measuring at the maximum gate voltage by default. So that is the on current at the maximum gate voltage. But if you want to stay a particular gate voltage beyond VT, where the device is in on state and you need to compare at only that particular location. In that case, you'll have to mention uh, the gate voltage of that particular uh, point. Only then it becomes relevant. Otherwise, uh, it would appear uh, that if you are not mentioning the gate voltage, it would appear that you are representing it at the highest gate voltage of operation. Second point uh, is the off current, which is usually measured in uh, at uh, VGS equal to zero. And uh, thirdly, the threshold voltage, which is 
one of the most important parameters of this field effect transistors. So basically, there are different methods of extraction of threshold voltage uh, depending on the applications. So if you look into a paper by Conde, uh, you will find he has reported 14 different techniques of extracting uh, threshold voltage in MOSFETs. So <clears throat> as I have said, uh, these MOSFETs, in this particular MOSFETs, the threshold voltage is very important. But out of all the different methods, the transconductance uh, extrapolation method is one of the most important ones. And also we have another one, which is very popularly used in the industry, uh, which is the constant current method. And this constant current method actually uh, depends on the applications which you are targeting. And it does not have uh, a very uh, physics-based explanation, but the transconductance method, on the other hand, has uh, the physics-based explanations, but it has its own disadvantages. Uh, but still, it is one of the most popularly used because it gives a very good prediction of the threshold voltage of the device. So apart from this, uh, another uh, parameter is the subthreshold swing uh, of a field effect transistor, which is very important in uh, low power applications. So what is the subthreshold swing? So it is the amount of gate voltage by which you can reduce the current uh, to, in order to reduce the current by one order of magnitude. So if you are moving for, from uh, 10 to the power minus 5 to 10 to the power minus 4 in the linear region or in the subthreshold region, then the amount of gate voltage which is required to make that uh, translation is known as the subthreshold swing. And the lower the subthreshold swing, the better, better is the switching property of the device. Uh, it is expressed usually uh, in millivolt per decade. Uh, millivolt is for the change in the gate voltage, and decade uh, is the change in that one order of magnitude of the drain current. So therefore, in this way, uh, these terms uh, summarize uh, uh, very briefly the different parameters that you need to see uh, in our transfer characteristics. And in this uh, particular plot, you can see the subthreshold swing is represented here. So basically here, S is the subthreshold slope. So the swing is just the inverse of the slope. Therefore, it is represented as 1 by S. So you should be very careful about choosing the terms. If you are talking about subthreshold slope, then you are actually uh, speaking about the slope of that particular region. And if you are talking about subthreshold swing, then you are actually expressing uh, in millivolt per decade. So these are the different uh, terms which you need to be very familiar uh, while doing your studies on MOSFETs and associated research. So now we move uh, to the short channel MOSFETs. Uh, so I would like to seek permission to have a break of around three minutes. Uh, the organizers, can I have a break for three minutes? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. 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 Yes. Am I audible? Yes. 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 Yes, sir. Yes, yes, you can take a short break. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so we'll have a five minutes break? Sure, sure. OK. So participants, uh, in the meantime, uh, you can uh, write your queries in chat box. So we'll have five minutes short break. Uh, don't be disconnected. Please be connected in this Google Meet. And you can write your query in the chat, chat box section. At the end of the uh, this first technical session, we'll uh, answer your queries and uh, and we'll try to give you all the answers, uh, whatever you have in your mind. So please write your queries in the chat box section. So we'll wait for five minutes and uh, then uh, speaker will st uh, resume again his talk. And 
I want to have an announce uh, another announcement uh, regarding the uh, certification. Uh, for each and every technical session, we'll uh, recording the meet attendance. So the atten certificate will be issued on the based on strictly based on the attendance only. Okay, and the feedback form. So we are monitoring the attendance for each and every technical session. So on basis on then every every attendees participants will get the certificate. So make available for the each and every session. Thank you. Uh, sir, myself, Dr. Arun Yadav, any link will be shared uh, for, for monitoring the attendance or that can be uh, also managed through the uh, online peak or uh, some other way. So, sir, please uh, uh, clarify it. Actually, attendance is being taken by the our side only. Uh, ongoing, when session is ongoing, we are taking multiple times uh, attendance of the participants. And okay. for this current session also, we have already taken the attendance. Okay sir. Okay, 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 sir. Because, uh, okay, sir. But uh, sometimes uh, maybe network issue. I know that you yes. can put the uh, attendance, and that may be any attendee may be found as a absent, uh, consider as a absent. So that can be also one way issue, sir. Uh, if, if there is any issue, you can raise your uh, concern. And uh, in actually, in the two hour session, yeah, the one hour session, we'll take the attendance every 15 to 20 minutes. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. Hello, all the participants. And, uh, we have formed a uh, WhatsApp group for the faculty and the students separately. So do join your respective groups and you can write your queries or concerns there also. Uh, because all time Google Meet chat uh, may be not possible or uh, that anything like uh, in the mail can be responded instantly. But WhatsApp messages can be responded instantly if you face any problem. So due to that, I request all all participants to join the WhatsApp group, which is circulated through mail in your uh, confirmation uh, registration mail and your link in, in the Google Meet link mail also. You will find that. Thing. Thank you. And we will shortly. And we will shortly. Uh, actually, I'm someone saying that my voice is not clear. Uh, so am I audible right now? Clearly. Yes, sir. Now that is okay, sir. Okay. Okay. Actually, I'm uh, suggesting everyone, or I'm requesting everyone to uh, please join the WhatsApp group. Uh, if you have any uh, problem, if you are finding any problem, you can uh, directly message in WhatsApp group. Then it can be instantly replied, uh, because sometimes mail cannot be replied instantly. So it is better to join this WhatsApp group by the, all the participants. The due to uh, for the faculty 
faculties and students that the two groups have different groups are there so they please join your respective groups thank you okay uh, so i think we can start yes yes you can start yeah uh, so thank you everyone for the break uh, it was much needed so we'll continue uh, with the different uh, discussions which we were doing and uh, this is one of the i think this is uh, eventually the point uh, which led to the development of this advanced devices which you are going to learn in this uh, faculty development program and the short term training program uh, the short channel effects in mosfets and uh, the main reason uh, behind uh, these interesting properties of mosfets is when you try to shrink uh, the device dimensions because uh, if we recall uh, and connect to the moore's law so the ultimate objective was to cram uh, more components on on the same chip area so the only uh, solution to this uh, was reduction of the gate length and the different dimensions uh, but after a certain point uh, when the channel length became comparable to the source and drain depletion widths so then certain degrading effects uh, uh, came to appear uh, in this metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistors and uh, this led uh, to the lookout for new alternatives uh, to mosfets and therefore we have uh, this uh, different devices like tfets uh, nanowire fets uh, and the spin fets and the negative capacitance fets coming into existence so what happens during this uh, short channel uh, effects uh, the gate starts losing uh, control over the channel so uh, in a way uh, if you look the ultimate objective of any transistor uh, which starts from the mosfet is the third control electrode which is the gate so apart from a source and drain uh, we are not considering the bulk at the moment so apart from source and drain uh, the third control electrode which is the gate uh, is the most primary element in a mosfet and we want that particular gate to have all the influence over the channel so that we can control and modulate the currents as required by changing the different biases now when you start sh shrinking the dimensions and when you start bringing the source and drain very close to one another then you find that apart from the gate the source and drain also now starts having important control over the entire channel so earlier also uh, in long channel device also that effect was there but since the channel length was very long so the percentage of the capture of the source and drain over the channel was very meager as compared to the gate so we could totally ignore it but when you start bringing them closer you will find that a important chunk a important percentage of the channel is now controlled uh, by the source and drain so in this time then the concept of charge sharing appears and the threshold voltage is affected the different uh, the different kinds of phenomenon appear and other effects uh, become very predominant so when we are talking about long channel and short channel devices uh, with respect to mosfets so we just know this picture uh, where we have a physical gate length of uh, length l and l dash is the effective uh, channel width so in case of long channel mosfets we can uh, assume that l dash is equal to l but in case of short channel uh, mosfets uh, l dash uh, has to be considered as a discretized uh, value and distinguishable from the original gate length l so here uh, i would like to explain uh, the charge the charge sharing concept uh, using uh, a particular online tool uh, so uh, is my screen visible uh, with the mosfet in view yes it is visible yeah thank you so yes, now it is visible yeah, yes, yeah thank you so here you see uh, as i was speaking so this uh, this is the imagine that this is the image of a short channel mosfet i have enlarged it uh, to have a better view so you can see that we have this uh, p type substrate and which is lowly doped as compared to the n plus region 
So the width of the depletion region uh, towards the body will be larger. And here we'll be having a very thin layer. So it is um, just represented here because I have to include these ions. Uh, so, but on the P type side of the substrate, you will have a larger width of the depletion region. And this depletion is again formed by the gate. So the depletion region here, uh, the depletion of the charges of the substrate is caused by the gate. And on, also on the both sides, you have the depletion widths uh, due to the junction with the source and drain. Now, the most important point here is, so if when the device was long and even when the device is short, so we can see the ultimate objective of forming or of uh, influencing the channel or the bulk by the gate is the emanating of this electric field or the mapping of these positive charges to the negative charges uh, in the channel region, right? So currently we are in the depletion mode, therefore the inversion region is not formed because I want to explain uh, the threshold voltage mapping, the threshold voltage rule off. So you see there is a mapping of each positive charge on the gate uh, with the negative charge in the body, right? So in this case, when you are shrinking the dimensions, then in that case, this drain and source will also have this electric field, which will emanate on some of the negative charge. Okay, so earlier also this effect was there, but since the gate length was very large, so the this capture of this uh, depletion width ions by the electric field of the source and drain was very negligible. But now you have reduced it, so therefore their contribution will also become immense in this. So it means what I'm trying to say here is that, so if you have, say for example, on a very crude number basis, if you have 30 negative ions in this particular region, say for example, right? So in case of long channel uh, devices, you could directly approximate that around 29 uh, of them were mimicked by the positive charge on the gate. So it was a very close number. Now, in case of a short channel device, you have uh, this 30 ions here. And out of them, if out of these, around 10 are captured by the source and drain. So it means you have only 20 ions left, which is available for the gate. So earlier, the gate had more number of ions to control. So it had a better control on that uh, particular region. Now, a major portion of it is now taken away by the source and drain. So even if you have 30 uh, uh, positive charges on the gate, you can see only, the gate can see only 20 charges. As a result of which, 20 more charges, 10 more charges have to be created to form uh, the equivalence. As a result of which, the threshold voltage now appears earlier because using only a very small amount of voltage, you are now able to generate, you are now able to mimic a larger number of uh, carriers. So the electric field ending from the gate to the, uh, to the bulk or the, to the depletion ions has now increased uh, due to, has to be increased to mimic the particular number of uh, ions in that particular region. So therefore, Earlier you had 30 and out of that 29 had to be mimicked by the gate. So therefore you had a threshold voltage say VT. So now you have 20 ions, the gate can see only 20 ions. So therefore it has to get again 10 more ions in the bulk so that the equivalence is maintained. So in that way, uh, the threshold voltage reduces because at the lower voltage now, uh, you can actually uh, have this emanation of this electric field. So what I mean to say is, Say, for example, I'll give you a very simple analogy. So say you have uh, three houses uh, which share a common uh, pond, right? We share water from a common pond. And say the house number B has the greatest influence over that particular pond. So now what will happen if the other two houses also have the same percentage of this water sharing? So now the gate will have lesser amount of water to share, right? Because this particular uh, water, which was earlier available, is already being shared by the source and drain. 
so since the gate has can induce the same effect with a very smaller amount of uh, voltage or since it can satisfy itself with a smaller amount of water so therefore the threshold voltage drops down so ultimately it is the amount of uh, voltage which you put on the gate to mimic the number of charges but some amount of charges have already been captured so you are left with lesser amount of charges as a result of which your threshold voltage uh, required to image them is now less so this is known as the charge sharing concept uh, in uh, for which gives to the rise of the short channel effects and according to the yaus model so there are different models of charge sharing and the yaus model is one of the most uh, popularly followed so in that case it is believed that the gate and uh, the drain the gate and the drain in this region say we are talking about this particular region shares 50 50 of the charges and the gate and the source also shares 50 uh, 50 of the charges in this particular depletion width so that is the yaus model but as you move into different models you will find uh, there are different implications which have been taken up uh, by 75 25 sharing and uh, other percentage sharing of the charges uh, in the region so this gives to the rise of the threshold voltage roll off so as you are shrinking it the gate sees fewer amount of charges so it needs only fewer amount of fewer voltage lesser voltage to mimic those charges because some of them has already been taken by the source and drain so therefore the source and drain now also now serves as the control electrode which we do not want as designers right so we want only the gate to control the channel but the source and drain are also now capturing the charges and uh, uh, the in influencing uh, the channel region and the threshold voltage so therefore the short channel effects are very degrading because we have undesirable uh, control electrodes coming up uh, earlier in long channel cases the effect was there but it was very minimum there was charge sharing towards the end of the channel uh, towards the end end portions of the channel length but that was very minimum so it could be ignored but when you are shrinking the dimensions the percentage of sharing becomes uh, very prominent so therefore since the gate has uh, to have a lesser voltage a lesser electric field to mimic the left leftover charges so therefore the threshold voltage drops down and uh, due to this the different uh, mechanism start okay so once again i'm uh, coming back to the slide i hope it is visible uh, is my slide visible on full screen yes sir okay so uh, a few effects we'll discuss the first one is the impact ionization uh, in mosfets so basically uh, whenever we are talking about uh, the impact ionization so you will find as the electron tr uh, travels from the source to the drain uh, due to the very high amount of electric field an electron hole pair may generate okay and since uh, the, the there there are two oppositely charged particles so the hole will travel uh, towards the substrate and if larger or excessive amounts of holes move towards the substrate it will form a resistive path due to which it may have uh, a, a voltage drop an appreciable amount of voltage drop and it co it can form a transistor action a bjt action and finally uh, you can have a breakdown you cannot have a uh, more amount of charges passing through here instead you will be having uh, some leakage throughout the through the virtually formed bjt in the bulk so therefore the impact ionization is one of the most degrading effects of this uh, short channel devices and uh, the one way of measuring the impact ionization effects in mosfets is by measuring the substrate current so that is one way because you will be having holes uh, if there is impact ionization then you will be having holes moving towards the bulk so it will constitute a current so higher the current higher is the impact ionization the second one is the hot carrier injection so the hot carrier injection is also uh, similar to the impact ionization effects uh, but instead of moving towards the bulk it moves towards the dielectric the gate oxide so these electrons get trapped there and over time uh, it destabilizes it destabilizes the entire a uh, dielectric and can even cause very degrading effects it will even cause to the instability of the dielectric and finally uh, there will be huge amounts of current flowing through the uh, dielectric in the form of tunneling so this is one of the uh, other effects which is known as the hot carrier injection 
And finally, we have the drain-induced barrier loading, uh, which is one of the most important phenomena which we see, uh, which we use to compare in our simulation models and the different models. And in this case, in a short signal device, uh, if you can see here, so this is the diagram. This dotted line is the energy band diagram for a long channel device. And this is the uh, energy band diagram for a short channel device. Now, when you are increasing the drain voltage, so this band will be suppressed, will be moved downwards. So here, uh, if you have an electron here, if you have an electron here, so it sees the same barrier in case of this long channel device. But for the short channel device, you see there is a major drop in the barrier height, as a result of which more electrons can easily cross the barrier and your currents will increase. So that is the drain induced barrier lowering. So an application of voltage on the drain is inducing uh, the lowering of the potential barrier or the energy bands uh, as seen by the electrons in the source. So if the, the ultimate principle of operation in MOSFETs is that if it sees a lesser barrier, so the electron can easily jump. So it will constitute more current. So therefore, in drain induced barrier lowering, since the device length is very small, so therefore, on application of the drain voltage, uh, your barrier is reduced considerably as a result of which the electron sees a very lesser barrier height, which can it can easily jump. So this is another perspective of the drain induced barrier lowering from the measurement uh, from the transfer characteristics. And this is very important. Uh, so here you see uh, you usually plot the transfer characteristics, which is your drain current versus gate voltage uh, curve for two, two, two different drain voltages. The first one is very small, uh, which is 0 0.1. And the second one is 1 1.5, which is uh, a larger. So, and you see there is an appreciable amount of difference in the threshold voltage of the two curves. It is the same device. So remember, it is the same device, but since uh, by applying the drain, the, currents, uh, the current plots are shifted, so it means the drain is trying to affect the barrier. So therefore, there is a change in current because only the barrier, if the barrier changes, then only you can have a change in the current. Otherwise, if there had been no drain effect on the uh, particular barrier, both the curves would have been overlapped one over the other. But in this case, since the drain is majorly affecting, so therefore there will be a shift in uh, threshold voltage. So a way of measurement is this. So you divide uh, the difference in the threshold voltage between these two curves by the difference in uh, the drain voltage. So in this case, uh, delta VD will be 1.4, 1.5 minus 1.1. And delta VTH will give the uh, corresponding change in the threshold voltage of that particular device. And it is expressed in millivolt per volt. So one of the most interesting questions which I received from students is that if it is a unit of volt, um, if both the quantities are volt, then why aren't we canceling? So we can cancel them. It is actually a ratio, but we are not canceling because we want to show the change in VTH due to the corresponding change in the drain voltage. So if it is, it is usually in millivolt per volt uh, because the change in threshold voltage is very less as compared uh, to the drain voltage normally. So therefore, we want to show that there is a millivolt change in the numerator due to a volt uh, order of change uh, in the denominator. So that's the reason we express it in millivolt per volt. Otherwise, it is a dimensionless uh, quantity. So uh, the threshold voltage roll off, this is one of the plots. So you can see here, uh, as you are decreasing the channel length, uh, so the threshold voltage drops down. Uh, so this is uh, this has already been explained uh, as I've explained in the diagram a few minutes before. So the final topic of today's lecture, and uh, which I feel uh, is very important and is not properly covered uh, in most of the books, <clears throat> and uh, the concept. Actually, the problem is where to start from uh, in terms of quantum capacitance. So therefore, this is this will give you a very brief understanding of the concept of quantum capacitance, especially the importance of quantum capacitance in uh, nano dimensional devices. So therefore, this attempt has been made in this lecture to introduce this. And it is very best understood with the help of the silicon nanowire 
uh, field effect transistor. So basically, the silicon uh, nanowire FET uh, looks something like this. It is a bottom gate uh, architecture. And these nanowires are uh, normally formed. Uh, you can find it in coaxial form, uh, in which it shows the figure on the right hand side. Uh, so you have the nanowire, and it is wrapped around by the gate dielectric and the gate. So a single walled uh, nanowire and multi walled nanowires also can be formed, but we'll be uh, restricti restricting it. Uh, to the concept of quantum capacitance only. So first of all, let us see what is quantum capacitance. So now you are very familiar with the uh, conventional geometric capacitance. So you have two metal plates which are separated by a dielectric medium. And as a result of that, you have the ability to store charge. And both the metal plates are made of metal. Now what if I replace one of those plates by a very low density of states material. So in that case, you would not have the effective capacitance of that arrangement of whatever that uh, capacitance is. Uh, it, it will not be equal uh, to the geometric capacitance which you know, epsilon naught A by D. Uh, so in that case, you will find that a capacitance in series with that original capacitance will appear. Okay, so that capacitance which is additional to the original geometrical capacitance is the quantum capacitance. So this is just a very conceptual view. So this is your normal uh, metallic plate capacitor. And here I replace uh, one of the plates. Uh, you can see the color has changed from uh, brownish to green. So you will find that it will be a series a combination of the geometric capacitance and the quantum capacitance. And this exactly appears in your uh, MOS devices, as you can see. And you will find that the uh, gate dielectric capacitance or the gate oxide capacitance in the MOS structure is in series with the quantum capacitance. And basically, uh, remember, we are talking about low density of states. So low density of states resembles to the two-dimensional electron gas, which we normally see uh, in our MOS-based devices. So therefore, in a MOS-based device, we have that uh, we have that scope of having that two-dimensional electron gas, and therefore we have that uh, particular possibility of having a quantum capacitance. But there are, of course, regions where these quantum capacitance are normally ignored, because if you look into this expression, so in um, in earlier days, uh, the geometric capacitance, which is uh, nothing uh, but your epsilon by d uh, per unit area or say T or X, I can say. So in those particular days, this T or X was very large, or uh, this epsilon was very small, or both the cases, combination of both. As a result of which, this C geometric, or the C ox in the case of MOSFET, uh, it was very small. And since this is in a parallel representation, so the effective capacitance will be closely equal or will be almost equal to the smaller of the two capacitances. So therefore, in that case, this quantum capacitance got ignored. OK, so therefore, this quantum capacitance effects got ignored. But now, when we are reducing the dimensions, we are bringing TOx to the nanoscale dimensions. We are increasing the uh, dielectric constant of the gate oxide. So in that case, these two parameters become now comparable as a result of which the quantum capacitance can have effect on the effective capacitance. And it contributes to the entire current conduction mechanism starting from the threshold voltage to the drain current. OK, so here uh, we are pre I'm presenting a few snapshots from my work, which we have done on uh, quantum capacitance in silicon nanowire field effect transistors. So you see, uh, this is a very interesting observation which we have made. So you have the drain current uh, versus gate voltage uh, on the left hand side. And with the change in diameter, if you are increasing the diameter, the current is increasing, right? Now you look into the plot for quantum capacitance versus gate voltage, which is this uh, particular plot, uh, the plot in the middle. So you see uh, for super threshold regions, uh, means I'm talking about after this, region after 0.5 you will find the 10 nanometer has the greatest value of this quantum capacitance and as you increase 
uh, the diameter, the quantum capacitance is actually decreasing, right? Now, if you look into the conventional equations of MOSFET, so what we can do, we can re replace the gate oxide by an effective capacitance. Because you remember that here, uh, this geometric will become 1 by COX plus 1 by CQ. So that, therefore, we are replacing it by the CQE or the effective quantum capacitance, where we are representing it as this particular equation, which is the series combination. So therefore, if you try to map uh, this particular curve with this equation, you will find that the drain current or the inversion charge, which we are talking about, will be inversely related to the quantum capacitance. So if the capaci quantum capacitance is less, so you will be having more current. And if the quantum capacitance is more, you will be having lesser current. So that is one of the most important observations of this work which we have done. And this also enables us uh, to use these equations in MOSFET-like models. So we can replace certain parameters of MOSFETs and then use uh, the quantum capacitance expression uh, just like a MOSFET and derive the drain current. Also, uh, another important point which I would like to represent here, this mobile charges that you see uh, is nothing but this uh, inversion charges uh, after 0.5. So here also, if you see, it directly resembles the drain current. If the diameter is less, then uh, the mobile charge is less. But again, it has an inverse relationship with this uh, quantum capacitance plot. So therefore, what concludes is that due to the parallel uh, representation and the series combination of quantum capacitance with the gate oxide capacitance, so therefore, in nanoscale dimensions, if both the quantities become comparable, uh, come in the same order, then it starts affecting uh, the drain current equations, okay? So uh, with this, I come to the end. Uh, so I'll be trying to move into the conclusions and prospects in research. So if we are looking into the general overview, so the field of semiconductor devices is obviously growing into a vast domain. You have lots of things emerging, uh, lots of newer concepts coming up. And um, uh, I can say that it was not possible to cover everything in this uh, two hour lecture. And also you have this different emergence of uh, the different devices like ferroelectric field effect transistor, the spin fed, and most importantly, the topological insulator based devices, which is another amazing addition uh, to the list of devices that we have. And lots of research problems exist. Particularly, uh, if since uh, in India, we have dirt of these fabrication facilities for uh, field effect transistors. So if you are looking for modeling problems, so you try to select a device which is very new uh, according to the IRDS and start modeling it and it will give you a very good prospect uh, for research. So you can select the device. Obviously, in the beginning, you'll be facing lots of hardships because you will have fewer materials to start with. But I can assure you that there, will, there are lots of things uh, which need to be done in the modeling perspectives. Secondly, uh, what are the relevant areas? As I have said, Classical and quantum-based approaches uh, in modeling of FETs are very, very important and will and are very much sought after by the industry, uh, by the different simulator uh, manufacturing organizations and companies. Uh, you can also go towards innovative simulation techniques. So you don't just follow the conventional techniques. You develop your own model. You develop your own numerical simulations and uh, start doing them. And find and another thing which I have uh, repeatedly been saying uh, over the last few lectures also at different places is the device circuit integration. We are lacking on this part, but uh, this is very feasible uh, in a country like India because we have, if we have the, the availability of softwares uh, like TCAD and the Cadence tools uh, and any circuit uh, related applications, we can do this and it will give actually, um, you, it will take you more closer uh, towards the application areas. And in terms of future prospects, we have lots of things coming up. Uh, we have the quantum computing, and based on that, you can formulate your devices, you can target your designs with respect to quantum computing, neural networks, and even you can model these devices using AI and machine learning. So if you uh, are not looking towards these fields, you can just uh, have a type in the IEEE Explorer, 
and you will find there are a few papers which have come up with machine learning based approaches uh, for device modeling and these are very interesting because it is a culmination of two different uh, disciplines and i am sure it will give rise to more interesting things in the future so uh, this lecture would be incomplete uh, without acknowledgments to some of the uh, very closest and dearest faculty members uh, and teachers which i have ha which, which which i have and i would like to mention them and without them actually it is not possible to uh, collect the materials to discuss have discussions and arrive at a presentation uh, i do not know how the presentation went and whether it would benefit you or not but uh, i hope that the things out of all the things that have been presented today uh, uh, some of the things may be newer to you and you can uh, work on those particular concepts and then move towards uh, new researches so uh, currently i am looking for prospective doctoral students also so at tejpur university we have uh, proper facilities of uh, device and circuit tools uh, software simulation tools and we have uh, very experienced faculty in the area of uh, modeling and fabrication also we have a nano fabrication laboratory here and we have uh, very good works going on in the area of sensors and fuel cells uh, so if you find or if you find it interesting uh, you can contact me the email id is there so with this i come to the end of this presentation uh, i thank you uh, all the members of hbtu kanpur for giving me this opportunity and also the ieee uh, up section uh, for organizing this uh, particular program so i would now like to open the floor for queries uh, i think most of you have uh, put them in the chat box so i'll take it from there okay uh, so we have uh, an interesting question by nayakanti prabin kumar sir uh, how are we going to scale channel lengths uh, like 90 nanometer 45 nanometer 22 nanometer why can't it be like 110 nanometer 30 nanometer based on what factors we select uh, channel scaling so this is a very interesting question uh, interesting not because of the numbers which uh, the respected participant has mentioned but interesting because why are we selecting this only this particular lengths now uh, it is a very interesting it again leads to stories actually when we come across this uh, particular lengths and nodes normally uh, when we started off with the technology node so there are plenty of definitions set out uh, by the semiconductor industry so some of them were like the technology node will represent the physical gate length some of them were like it would represent uh, the gapping between the different metal layers the metal lines of vlsi which you have probably seen so over times uh, the definition of technology node changed but what uh, one thing remained uh, very constant was these numbers because if you reduce if you scale down the device lengths by this number you would reduce uh, the area by around uh, 50% so there is a relationship uh, by by the number when you relate it with 1 by root 2 so in terms of that in terms of the area power consumption actually uh, this particular lengths are selected so when these lengths are selected and the scaling uh, is done you usually have a reduction of a power of 50% so this thing is uh, available uh, uh, in many uh, books you can just uh, google it because uh, the exact uh the exact derivation uh, exact actually comes from the denard's uh, scaling law and the different constant voltage and constant electric field scaling another point uh, which has been mentioned is uh on what uh factors we select channel scaling so the primary factor that we select uh, there are only three terms where we have this trade off the power area and speed so basically Uh, it depends what application we are uh, targeting so if we are mainly when we discuss about low power electronics then we basically go with the low power uh, concept but in terms of high performance and high speed your priorities will uh, different and you need to scale the device uh, accordingly in terms of the 
results which you can see from by varying the different parameters so basically it is a relative concept and uh, the one thing which i can say in terms of uh, this mosfets and all for low power electronics you basically look at the uh, power consumption so if you are looking at the power consumption then you are uh, looking at the off current you are always trying to uh, reduce the off current and increase the on current which is again a disadvantage in tfets which you will see in the upcoming lectures by uh, the other eminent speakers uh, so therefore uh, in some devices we achieve uh, a particular parameter which is very good for the others it degrades but then that is the where the research statement comes in and you need to improve uh, your uh, devices so another thing in the irds uh, ananya bhattacharjee has asked in the irds blueprint non cmos technology devices have been mentioned what prospective non cmos devices are in line for research problems okay so for this uh, let us move uh, to my slide where i had shown uh, the irds mentions so probably the slide is visible so whenever we are talking about uh, this non cmos technology so in that case those are the technologies where the normal uh, formulation of this mos like uh, equations and concepts do not hold so in those cases whatever device you select or whatever logic you select is very new at this moment so you can always take up any device and work on the uh, modeling principles because uh, in in terms of simulation principles i won't be able to uh, comment much because not much has been progressed in that area Uh, because since these devices are new the models are still being developed but if you can model a particular non uh, cmos device like spin fed or mod fed or even uh, this nanomagnetic logic so in those cases uh, if you model something and just have a comparison with the fabricated device and you get a very good uh, match uh, then you can obviously proceed with that and there are plenty of research problems you can start with the model you can build a virtual simulator of your own from that particular model and who knows uh, if your model is very good then it can even be taken up by some of the uh, simulation simulation companies uh so another thing is quantum capacitance and chemical capacitance same uh, different sources provided different answers so had this query on this uh basically there is yes i agree with this uh, there is an overlap of the uh, terminologies but basically what you need to understand is wherever there is a low density of states region in that case you will be having uh, the possibility of quantum capacitance so therefore whenever you have this 2d z formation and it is comparable with the gate oxide thickness so in that case you will be having uh, the effects of this uh, quantum capacitance so uh, vladek grabinski has said your slide is very small please use uh, full screen okay so uh probably he is i don't know he is speaking about this uh, because i want i was on this slide uh so is this fine yeah now it's fine okay. yeah 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 so what i was uh, addressing to ananya's question uh is he she has asked that what are the research prospects so the research prospects there are plenty of prospects in this uh, non cmos devices because uh these are very few uh, these are explored in a very less manner so we have lots of ample opportunities there are very less amount of spice models which are developed in this we can create uh, we can use the spice level 3 and all the level 3 level models to make them uh, compatible with the mosfet like models for these devices you can model the different thresholds uh, if it is a multi threshold device if we, you can even comment on the different conditions so there are lots of works Uh, actually in uh, non cmos uh, devices so i would like to take other questions uh, yeah uh, yeah welcome welcome mr grabinski so yeah, do we, do we have other questions uh, all yeah. the participants i am requesting if anyone have any question you can unmute yourself and you can ask directly or you can uh, write in the chat box also
hukum sir uh, we'll wait for one minute and then we'll close the session yes yes sure answer. sure sure so uh, also i would like to say that if you if any participant is uh, like having questions which you are not sure at this moment you can also email to me so i am typing my email id in the chat box so that uh, you can uh, contact with me uh, whenever you find any problems i'll try my best uh, to solve them uh, although they may not be very instantaneous uh, there may be delays in replying because we are having this end semesters so therefore uh, thank you thank you mosiki uh, kor for your uh, comment thank you very much i think uh, uh yeah question from the audience side right now uh, yeah. if you have any question you can directly ask for the uh, speaker session you can directly contact me through the yeah. email, uh, email address yes and i sincerely uh, thank dr rupam goswami sir for this nice presentation and to enlighten about the uh, from the basic basic of semiconductor devices to the advance of semiconductor devices in the current trend and what is the future prospects of these devices and the, some critical uh, fact and operation also has been described by dr rupam goswami sir and uh, i really thank uh, full to him to uh, for giving us such a nice presentation thank you rupam sir thank you dr mitra and uh, i sincerely um, uh, offer my thanks uh, to your department uh, to your university and to the ieee up section uh, for this uh, platform uh, i don't know how much uh, i was able to like influence the participants but i think uh, it was on a average it was okay so uh, thank you and yes. i think i can leave the meeting yes 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 thank you yeah yeah thank you so much That's and yeah. all the participants uh, the second session will start from 2:30 onwards uh, so you have a uh, 40, 40 minutes of a uh, break lunch break so uh, have lunch and we'll meet at uh, 2:25 5 minutes before i am request everyone to join 5 minutes before the start, starting of the session so meet link will be the same meet link and you will uh, we'll start the session at 2:30 pm on uh talent fit and skill fit need and performance aspect with statistical analysis so uh have lunch and we'll meet at 2:25 pm thank you everyone thank you sir thank you so much sir